Hey everyone, welcome back to another hardware news recap. This week's been pretty busy. TSMC is seven nanometer process leading for fourth quarter 2018 revenue. Intel's making moves for seven nanometer production, uh, including in the US, actually, one of their old fabrication plants. 1660 Ti, continued news, rumors, announcements, uh, Backblaze's report, and also this thing we're gonna be talking about today. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair One i140 compact gaming PC. The Corsair One i140 is a small form factor PC outfitted with a 9700K, RTX 2080, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and a 480 gigabyte NVMe SSD, all housed within a two millimeter thick aluminum chassis. The Corsair One i140 is a 12 liter system fit for desktop use with the same sized i160 counterpart with higher end parts. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, the LN2. Uh, this is a giant liquid nitrogen container. We just got it in. We have a special guest, Pro Overclocker, coming in. And the stream will be on Sunday. So that's the 27th. Is that right? I think, I think it's the 27th, Sunday. And that'll be at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, we'll put some other times on the screen or something just to help you out. But 1 p.m. Eastern time in the US. And uh, we'll be, uh, there will be a special guest here. We're going to be using liquid nitrogen. We're going to be overclocking a 9980XE. And that's primarily what's going to get the LN2. So this is a, a Der Bauer Beast pot that I have here, LN2 pot. And then we, I don't know what we're going to do with the video cards. We might just do water to make it easy but we do have the capability to do LN2 out there as well. It just depends on how complicated we want to make things. So definitely check back. It's going to be our most fun stream yet. And uh, having a special guest is also going to make it a lot more fun because it's someone who, uh, like I said, pro overclocker. So a lot of experience and should make things pretty interesting for everyone. So absolutely check back on Sunday. That'll be one day from the day this video is posted at 1 p.m. Eastern time, US, and, uh, and you can check out the stream on our YouTube channel. First news item here is a TSMC seven nanometer process takes the lead for fourth quarter 2018 revenue. And in 2018, TSMC expected to post record revenue growth for fourth quarter thanks to their advantage presently in seven nanometer manufacturing being basically the only ones doing it. So TSMC announced that it expects over 100 different seven nanometer designs to be taped out by 2019. And it uh, also seems that its predictions so far have been accurate because as TSMC technology uh, has been the biggest driver of revenue in the, first, in the final quarter of 2018, TSMC is also looking towards a strong first quarter of 2019. Seven nanometer accounted for 23% of TSMC's total revenue in fourth quarter 2018, while it made up about 10% of their annual 2018 revenue. Pretty impressive considering the company wasn't doing seven nanometer the entire year. And uh, further, this, oh, and if you didn't know, it was ramped in about June. So that's pretty good, uh, pretty good revenue share considering that it's only been a couple of months, six months or so. TSMC has looked at lucrative partnerships with AMD, Apple, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm who will all lean on TSMC's competitive advantage with 7 nanometer. TSMC is expected to roll out its second generation 7 nanometer technology sometime in 2019, which will include the use of EUV or extreme ultraviolet lithography, something that we've talked about on this channel in the past with uh, expert technical analyst David Cantor. If you missed that video, you should check it out. We talk 10 nanometer versus 7, and we talk about EUV as well. It's an important technology. Uh, Intel setting the stage for seven nanometer production on its side of the fence. So this has been a long time coming. Uh, according to a report by the o Oregonian, the uh, Intel is preparing to expand its Oregon D1X facility to accommodate future seven nanometer production. The report cites, quote, unnamed sources. My voice is reverberating off of the LN2 container. <laughs> cites unnamed sources. So uh, take this with a grain of salt, of course. It also cites Quote, people familiar with conversations, uh, whatever that means, overheard it in a coffee shop or something, saying that Intel could begin construction as early as June for its seven nanometer updates. Now, despite sort of the, uh, the sarcasm there, this does actually look like it's going to be a thing because Intel's own public and official timelines do align with this. So this is something Intel has itself talked about in the past. Uh, so what's going on then? Basically, there's a project that looks to add a, a third phase to D1X, the Oregon facility, and it looks like that'll be equipped for EUV 7 nanometer production. Speaking of TSMC, it's, uh, Intel is going the same direction. Construction would last 18 months, followed by several months of upfits for uh, equipment installation. So this is not a quick process. And this is all according to the 
or, or, Oregonian, 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 I don't know. They're sources, them. Uh, so last December, Dr. Ann Kelleher, senior vice president and GM of manufacturing and operations at Intel, announced that Intel had plans for multi-year expansions at its Oregon plant and uh, included as well Israel and Ireland for its expansion options. So the Oregonian or whatever, their report seems to align with Intel's plans. And uh, despite this being sort of peppered with phrases like familiar with conversations, it does appear to be a real thing. This one's sort of interesting and caught us a bit off guard. So there's a lawsuit dating back to 2015 that had just been granted class action certification and has been allowed to proceed. And this has a date set for February 5th, 2019 to establish a timeline. The lawsuit will see AMD and plaintiffs take a case regarding uh, what the definition of a CPU core is before a jury in California. This is assuming that AMD doesn't decide to settle out of court as companies often do, but the company has already committed to defending itself vigorously. In quotes, the plaintiffs allege that they were misled by AMD's representation of their FX processors, whereby AMD marketed the chips as eight core desktop CPUs. The crux of the issue is in the way AMD defines a CPU core with the FX series, each x86 core resides on a module with another x86 core and resources like L2 cache, floating point unit, and instruction fetch and decode circuitry all shared between the cores. The plaintiffs claim this messaging is disingenuous and that the FX series is not native in an, as an eight core part and only has four functional cores. The plaintiffs seek compensation for the difference between an eight core and a four core CPU. The SKUs in question are the FX8120, 8150, 8320, 8350, 8370, 9370, and 9590. And the complaint states the following. According to plaintiffs, a quote core is a processing unit that is able to operate, e.g. perform calculations and execute instructions independent from other cores positioned on a chip. Plaintiffs allege that the bulldozer CPUs advertised as having eight cores actually contain eight subprocessors, which share resources such as L2 memory caches and floating point units. As for what's going to happen with that case, well, it's, it's sort of just getting started. So we'll keep you posted. This one's a rumor, but well, it seems like it's probably going to be a thing, probably going to be accurate. 1660 Ti arriving in February for $280 with a 1660 to follow and apparently a 1650 in the works. So we haven't, we've, we've confirmed bits and pieces of this, but not all of it. We've already confirmed a 1660 Ti is going to exist. Uh, we haven't confirmed or checked with anyone on a timeline or a price. So that's Hard OCP's reporting. And this report by Hard OCP citing uh, sources close to the product is attaching launch dates to NVIDIA's long rumored non-RTX Turing based cards and uh, also is looking at pricing. So they're saying February 15th for $280 and a GTX 1660 non-TI Hard OCP reports will allegedly arrive in early March for $230 if the reporting is accurate, while the low-end GTX 1650 will come in late March for $180 uh, based upon this report. So this is, uh, this is what we know so far. It's unofficial information, of course, and uh, it's, well, some of it, the 1660 Ti bit is, is probably accurate, you can surmise. Interestingly, Hard OCP claims NVIDIA will continue to supply the 1050 Ti, presumably in lieu of a 1650 Ti, Take all of this with a grain of salt, of course, though, as we've speculated, fleshing out a selection of Turing options sans RTX makes a whole lot of sense as developers and consumers have largely been slow to acclimate to ray tracing in real time anyway. Developers are slow to support it and consumers have been unprepared to pay for it. Among a few more trivial hardware announcements, but ones which are cemented in press releases, so they're official, Samsung has announced its new 970 Evo Plus family of SSDs, trailing Western Digital's recent black SN750 launch that's been in the news lately. So the 970 Evo Plus will supersede the 970 Evo as Samsung's sort of high-end consumer NVMe SSD, while also being Samsung's first mainstream offering using 96-layer 3D NAND. The 970 EVO Plus, like its predecessor, uses the M2 2280 form factor and a PCIe 3.0 by 4 connection. The drive will be offered in capacities of 250 gigabytes, 500 gigabytes, and 1 terabyte, as well as 2 terabytes, 
As usual, speeds will vary a bit based on capacity, specifically sequential write speeds. Nonetheless, the drives are rated for sequential read and write speeds up to 3500 megabytes per second and 3300 megabytes per second, respectively. The construction of the 970 EVO Plus hasn't changed significantly based on the paper specifications. The new drives will still use the Samsung Phoenix controller and LPDDR4 DRAM which makes the key focus of these drives at Samsung's fifth generation 3D NAND. Samsung's newest generation of NAND should allow them to remain competitive in pricing while also increasing density, improving cost per gigabyte and performance per watt, in theory anyway. MSRPs for the 970 EVO Plus are going to be $90 for the 250 gigabyte model, $130 for the 500 gigabyte model, 250 for one terabyte, and TBD for two terabytes. Uh, Samsung offers a five-year warranty with all of its 970 EVO Plus models with the TBW or Total Bytes written data available in Samsung specs on their website. So noticeably absent is any mention of a 970 Pro Plus model and Samsung could be waiting for the arrival of PCIe 4.0 or even 5.0 since that has been firmly ratified at this point. Finally, Backblaze, the backup company, has released its annual hard drive report. So the report for 2018, if you don't know, Backblaze puts these out every year and often quarterly too. There are reports on thousands upon thousands of hard drives and the reliability of those drives in a real data center and backup storage solution uh, enterprise. So you can see sort of how many of their drives have failed in different categories. And it's always interesting. It's, it's of course, one source for information, but they have thousands of drives, so it's a pretty good source. So Backblaze's 2018 report mostly uh, is unsurprising if you've seen their previous ones. These kinds of reports do tend to highlight broad trends in data storage as well. So the trends, according to Backblaze stats, are that there is continued migration towards denser storage and the annualized failure rate has lowered, which is, of course, a good thing. The information comes from a, a monitoring process of 104,778 hard drives this time across 15 different models. For 2018, Backblaze continued to replace two, three, and four terabyte hard drives with eight, 10, and 12 terabyte options. They even had some 14 terabyte options added to the mix, and those are the helium-filled PMR drives from Toshiba. A couple of highlights from the report are uh, as follows. In 2016, the average size of hard drives in use was 4.5 terabytes. By 2018, the average size had grown to 7.7 .7 terabytes. The 2018 annualized failure rate of 1.25% was the lowest by far of any year that Backblaze has recorded. So interesting information on hard drives. And as always, we'll have all these links in the show notes below if you want to check the sources for these stories. And then that brings us back to the conclusion here. Check back for our overclocking live stream Sunday. That's tomorrow at the time this video goes live. So that'll be Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Uh, check back. We'll be doing some liquid nitrogen overclocking. It'll be the first time we've ever live streamed it. So hopefully, hopefully the tank hasn't leaked. Otherwise, we won't be able to do it. But check back. You can check twitter.com slash gamersnexus for updates. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. And I'll see you all next time.